<clears throat> How many of you have heard of the ACE studies? Adverse Childhood Experience Studies. Let me just back up a little bit and explain this. These studies are um, they're epidemiology studies, which means they basically took a large group of people, and the first one was looking at 17,000 or so adults, and they asked them to say, did you have any of these things happen when you grew up? And they'd say yes or no, and they'd basically check the box. Not a very in-depth assessment of these adversities, but nonetheless very interesting, in large part because what they found was if you have any of these adversities, you start to increase your risk for almost any bad thing you can think of, which is kind of crazy. When people first started reading this, they're like, wait a minute. It increases your risk for becoming a criminal and becoming victimized. It increases your risk for heart disease, for cancer. In fact, if you have three or more adverse experiences as a child, your risk for heart disease is higher than it is if you smoke. So some of the findings were a little shocking if you're used to a conventional perspective on understanding physical health or even mental health. But now, as many of you are aware, an understanding of developmental stress, that, that you, the pattern of your developmental stress experiences can make a huge difference in the way you, the physiology of your body and brain organize and function. And so what happens is, the more you have extreme, prolonged, or, or chaotic patterns of stress activation, the more likely you are to activate your stress response systems in these persistent and, and essentially dysregulated ways. And that leads over time to, it wears out your heart, it wears out your pancreas, it wears out your lungs, it influences development of parts of your brain and, and makes parts of your central nervous system not function as well. So these kids are at higher rate, risk for learning problems and anxiety problems and affect regulation problems and problems with psychosis, literally, problems with fine motor control, problems with speech and language, any part of the brain that is essentially reached by these fundamental neural networks, and I'll just, just give you a picture of them just so you have some un brief understanding. <clears throat> now this is talk about a simple model. This is a, this is a simplistic perspective view of the brain. If you take the brain and envision it as an upside down triangle, there's the top, the cortex, and then there's the lower parts down here, the brain stem, and the brain is organized in a hierarchical way, but there are certain neural networks that are very, very centrally located. They originate in lower parts of the brain and they send direct communications to multiple parts of the brain and influence outflow to the body through the neuroendocrine and autonomic nervous systems. And the, the reality is because of this architecture, because they're right here in lower parts of the brain, and because all sensory input from the outside world and the inside world stops low in the brain, this is Grand Central Station for the stress response system. And I know people talk about the amygdala, and that's, that's, it's very important in certain aspects of the stress response, but the reality is the fundamental stress regulatory networks originate in lower parts of the brain. And they do so because that's where you get direct input from the sensory input from the outside world and from your body. And it makes complete sense that you would have no synaptic, you wouldn't have multiple synaptic pathways before you would, connections before you'd actually be able to act on the incoming information. So th this, is, this is part of an understanding of why adversity can alter the organization of the brain and alter the physiology of the body. Anything that causes these neural networks to be poorly organized or dysregulated is going to cause a cascade of problems in every part of the brain that they reach and all areas of the body that they flow out to. And so that's why when you have all of these patterns of adversity, what we would call, refer to as a sensitizing pattern caused by all kinds of different things that happen during development, you can end up with overactive and overly reactive stress response physiology and all these problems. Now I'm saying all of this because what we know is that this sensitizing pattern that I'm talking about, and I'll just show you what that looks like, just because this is a science symposium. If you take these neural networks and, you, and they have a baseline level of activity and under normal, you know, you stimulate them with a moderate activation of something, 
they'll have a peak activation and then they'll go back down to their baseline. But the fact is, if you start stimulating them again, even minimally before they get back to their baseline, your body basically says, oh, I need to be more active, I need to be more active, I need to be more active, and, and you end up changing your baseline. So if you're, you're a child who is normally would have a resting heart rate of 100 beats per minute, or 80 beats per minute, all of a sudden your resting heart rate creeps up to 90, then 100, and 105, and you're tuned up. And for the same challenge that caused a moderate response down here, this challenge causes a major response. And many of you have heard about post-traumatic stress presentations, kids that have been exposed to domestic violence, to various kinds of abuse and neglect. That causes a sensitization of these networks. Now the reason I'm, again, I'm telling you this science because I want you to understand the science and power underneath a relational interaction. If you take the very same neural networks and rather than stimulating them in these uncontrollable, unpredictable ways and you activate them in tiny little controllable doses, you literally will start to shift, you get a completely different change in the baseline and the reactivity of these systems.